feel like I lost a piece of myself. It's more like I lost memories I could have had with you. These are the words spoken by Gwyn Gabe, the father of 24-year-old Alexis Gabe, at a memorial in her honor almost a year after she suddenly disappeared in January of 2022. The true crime story of Alexis Gabe is one filled with strange evidence, bizarre twists and turns, and details that her family and investigators are still struggling to come to terms with, and many questions remain unanswered as the man believed to be responsible for her disappearance refused to divulge any information he had and ultimately lost his life at the hands of police. Alexis Gabe was taken down by one of the people she trusted most, one of her closest friends. The problem is, no one knows why. Thankfully, this case has finally been solved, but the real search for answers, well, it's only just begun. Alexis's parents, Gwen and Rowena Gabe, met while they were still children growing up in the Philippines. But in 1986, when Gwen was 16 years old, they lost contact when Gwen's family decided to relocate to the US. It would be many years before they saw each other again, but they were able to reconnect when Gwen and his family returned to the Philippines for a vacation. This time, they stayed in touch. In 1994, they decided to get married. They moved to Antioch, California, before ultimately settling in Oakley, where they raised a family of three children, Alexis being the middle child and their only daughter. Growing up, Alexis was a happy and creative girl who found joy in fashion, drawing, and photography. Alexis was a girl who wouldn't let anything keep her down. She always tried hard to find the best in a bad situation, and this was a personality trait that would follow her throughout her life. After graduating from Liberty High School in Brentwood, she attended the Contra Costa Medical College in Antioch and graduated as a qualified EKG technician, someone who helps patients who are suffering from severe heart conditions. It doesn't seem like Alexis was ever able to put her degree to work because just after leaving school, she started working at a Rite Aid pharmacy, where according to some of the customers that she dealt with, she was always ready to greet anyone with a smile and put their needs first. It's clear that even those who only knew Alexis in passing knew that she was an incredibly bright and caring young woman. As time passed by, Alexis met a man named Marshall Jones and the two started dating. But at some point, their relationship broke down, but the specifics of this are unclear. The two remained friends and would still hang out on occasion. The relationship ended relatively smoothly and neither of the two had any bad blood with the other. Or so it would seem. See, while Alexis seems as though she was ready and willing to move on from their relationship, Marshall wasn't. It's unclear if Marshall was just deeply in love with Alexis or if he was merely obsessed over her for other reasons. But Marshall made a promise to himself that one way or the other, he wasn't letting Alexis get away. It was the 26th of January, 2022, when one of Alexis's friends spoke to her through a FaceTime call at around 6 p.m. She would later tell investigators that Alexis seemed to be sitting in her car, presumably in the parking lot at work. About 20 minutes later, she was seen by security cameras at a Chevron gas station on Lone Tree Way in Brentwood. Alexis then left the gas station and traveled to Marshall Jones's house, her now ex-boyfriend, which was located on Bent Tree Way. Now, fair warning, a lot of the street names in this story have to do with trees or ways, so it can be a bit hard to follow at times, but I'll do my best to make sure that everything's as clear as possible. After arriving on Bent Tree Way, Alexis's car's data history suggests that it was turned off at exactly 6.32 p.m. It's believed that this is the time that she arrived at Marshall Jones's house, and her cell phone records show that she remained in that area for quite some time. Alexis's father attempted to contact her at around 7.30 that evening, just about one hour after she arrived to meet up with Marshall. But she never picked up the phone. He wasn't too concerned about this at first because Alexis was always in the habit of staying out late. Most of the time, Gwen would wait up for her, but on this particular day, he and his wife had both caught COVID, and so they went to bed earlier than they normally would. Later that night, at 9.23 p.m., Alexis's GPS showed that her car had started up and both it and her cell phone left Lone Tree Way. The car then traveled to Oakley, which wouldn't be particularly unusual, except for the route that it followed. Alexis had a very specific route that she usually drove from Antioch to Oakley, 
and this was the first time that the GPS showed her deviating from that route. Finally, the car came to a stop on Trenton Street, where it was turned off at around 9.35 p.m., and it didn't move again after this. The only problem was, her cell phone did. The person driving the car exited the vehicle and was seen by security cameras walking along Oakley Road and Belden Lane with Alexis's cell phone in their possession. The only problem was, the person seen in the footage, it wasn't Alexis. Finding time to unwind at the end of the day can be difficult at times, but finding something to help you unwind can be even worse. I personally try to pass the time by playing retro games or mobile games, but if I'm being honest, most of these games just aren't worth the time of day. But that's where Dice Dreams comes in. Dice Dreams is the perfect way to relax at the end of a long day. The characters are adorable and relatable, and the best part is you don't need an internet connection to play. And did I mention it's completely free? I love playing Dice Dreams when I've got some free time waiting in line at a store, or just when I'm traveling around or running errands. Dice Dreams lets you roll the dice, attack your friends, steal coins, and build an incredible magical kingdom, and eventually become the Dice King. You can create a team of friends and send them gifts, or even try to steal from them. It's totally up to you. I love building new kingdoms. It's super satisfying and kind of feels like finishing a huge puzzle. Join my Dice Dreams team for free using the link in the description. But there are only 50 spots available on my team, so be sure to join quickly. And that means joining a user base of more than 10 million players worldwide. Just click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. Thanks to Dice Dreams for sponsoring today's video. Less than five minutes later, after this unidentified person of interest was captured on CCTV, Alexis's phone was turned off and the person carrying it walked to Live Oak Road, arriving there at about 10.06 p.m. They would eventually walk under Laurel Pass, make their way to the same Chevron gas station where Alexis was seen earlier that night, and then walk towards Cedar Point Way. Marshall Jones, Alexis's ex-boyfriend, had phone records showing that he messaged Alexis at 11.16 p.m. that night, asking whether she got home safely, and when there was no reply, he called her number about 20 minutes later. But since her phone was turned off by this point, there was no answer. The following morning, her family was surprised to find that Alexis still wasn't home. She'd been given the responsibility to make sure that her 15-year-old brother made it to school on time every day, and she would pick him up at the end of each school day. She'd been doing this for months. So when she suddenly didn't show up to take him to school, well, her parents were naturally worried. When her brother realized that she was late that morning, he sent her a text message asking where she was, but he got no reply. Her father immediately became concerned, since this wasn't something Alexis would normally do, and hence he called Marshall to see if he knew where she was. Marshall stated that Alexis had been at his house the previous evening, but that she left at around 9 p.m. after deciding to go to her best friend's house. The next logical step was to call Alexis's friend. But this is where the case takes a sinister turn. Her friend told Alexis's family that she was in Sacramento and that Alexis knew she was there, so she would never have planned on visiting her at home. Unable to leave the house thanks to battling COVID, her parents asked their oldest son to go to the police station to file a missing person report. In the meantime, they contacted all of their daughter's friends and each of their relatives to see if anyone had seen her, but no one had. Family and friends quickly gathered together to start searching for her by driving around the area to see if they could spot her or her car. And their efforts paid off quickly. Alexis's car was found abandoned where it had been parked the previous night, in an area just five minutes from the family's home. Alarmingly, the driver's side door was found to be unlocked, and the keys were still in the ignition, something Alexis would never do. A search of the immediate area was carried out with the help of Alexis's parents. By this point, her parents were so concerned that they decided to ignore the stay-at-home orders during their battle with COVID, and they opted to leave the house anyway in search of their daughter. But unfortunately, despite their best efforts, no sign of Alexis was found. Security footage from the intersection of Trenton Street and Carrington Drive, where her car was found parked, showed a male suspect driving Alexis's car into the area before abandoning it and walking away. Now, keep in mind that whoever left the car there also had Alexis's phone with them, and hence they were likely responsible for her disappearance, since they would have likely come forward if this wasn't the case. 
Investigators estimated that the man was about 5 foot 11 inches tall and revealed that he was wearing an oversized jacket and had a mask over his face, though it failed to hide the fact that he had a beard. What's interesting about this is that these descriptions almost perfectly align with Marshall Jones, Alexis's ex-boyfriend. Detectives didn't have a whole lot to go on at this point, but with this newfound information, they decided it was best to keep their options open while keeping a very close eye on Marshall. And that's exactly what they did. During an interview with investigators, Marshall reiterated the timeline that he'd given to Gwen and Rowena the previous day, stating that Alexis had been at his house the previous evening, but that she left at around 9 p.m. after deciding to go to her best friend's house. He gave investigators permission to search his house with the exception of the bedrooms, which, if you ask me, isn't much of a search. If there's anything in a home worth finding, chances are it's going to be found in one of the bedrooms. The only problem was, at this point, police didn't have enough evidence against Marshall to secure a warrant. So if he said they couldn't go into those rooms, they had no choice but to obey his wishes. Marshall also handed over his phone so that it could be analyzed by a forensic team. And once this was done, he traveled to his mother's house on Bent Tree Way. And this is where things get pretty strange. Once he arrived at his mother's house, he backed his SUV into the driveway and started unloading several large trash bags from the back of it. This was evidenced by a surveillance camera that recorded short clips of his movements. Following this, he went to the Oakley Police Department where he picked up his phone and then went back to his mother's house where he picked up the bags that he'd removed from his car and placed them back inside, all while his mother was hosting a karaoke party inside the house, supposedly blissfully unaware of his suspicious activity. He and his mother then left the house together and went to a Metro PCS cell phone store, where Marshall bought a new phone and even got a new phone number. Keep in mind that while all this was going on, Alexis remained missing, and her friends and family were desperately trying to locate her. But Marshall never made any attempt to look for her. Interestingly, even though Marshall got a new phone number and a new phone, he kept his old phone and his old number active. Marshall visited his sister later that evening and left her house at about 7.11 p.m. He still had both of his phones with him, but one was turned off at 6.40 p.m. and the other was turned off at 7.11 as he left his sister's house. But before 9 o'clock that night, one of the phones was turned back on for a brief period and phone records show that it was in the vicinity of Bradshaw and Jackson Roads. Surveillance footage would later be found showing a vehicle similar to Marshall's being driven on Bradshaw Road, then suddenly turning on to Jackson Road, giving police a very accurate play-by-play -play of Marshall's movements from that evening. It's believed that Marshall made a wrong turn at one point and then turned his phone on to use its GPS function. In fact, investigators would later state that when they drove to Pioneer, they also missed the turnoff just as Marshall had. When his phone was turned back on again the next day at 12.43, it showed that Marshall was about 16 miles from Antioch, and he then drove back to his mother's house, arriving there at about 1 p.m. He only spent a short while there, and then traveled back to his sister's house where it's believed he spent the rest of the day. Now, Marshall was supposed to report to work the following day, but he called his boss to say that he was taking a personal day, since he, quote, had something to take care of. The next day, for reasons that remain unclear, his sister asked him to leave her house, and he was later seen on surveillance footage carrying around, of all things, an extended firearm magazine, which came completely out of left field. That same day, searchers found a broken screen belonging to an iPhone 11 Pro, the same phone that Alexis owned, but the rest of the phone was nowhere to be found. The screen was collected and sent in for a forensic analysis, and wouldn't you know it, when the results came in, Marshall's DNA was found all over the screen. By now, investigators were certain that Marshall knew way more than he was letting on, and they applied for a search warrant of his mother's house on Bent Tree. During the search, Luminol showed that blood was present inside the lid of a washing machine. This sample was sent to a lab for testing, and it would later reveal that it contained Alexis's DNA. They also noticed that the shower curtains from the bathroom were missing, and when Marshall's car was searched, they found more of Alexis's DNA in the back though it was never determined whether this stemmed from blood or a different source. 
The day after the search, Marshall boarded a plane in California and traveled all the way to Washington, where he then stayed with his father for a few days. An awfully convenient time to take a trip to check up on family. On the 3rd of February, just two days later, a search was conducted of his mother's house, but it was never revealed whether or not detectives found anything else of interest here. Later on that month, a search warrant was granted for a search of Marshall's sister's house. And here, investigators found a handwritten note containing directions to Pioneer. They believed this handwriting belonged to Marshall, and it seemed as though he'd been documenting a journey he'd taken to Pioneer just a short while ago. But why? The note specified when to turn right or left along the way, as well as the time it would take to drive between each of these points. And this alone was a pretty suspicious thing to note down. When this was discovered, investigators theorized that Marshall must have ended Alexis's life and then drove to this specific area to dispose of her body. But now they needed to prove it. Search parties immediately drove to the area, detailed in the note, to see what they could find. They were accompanied by land, air, and water search teams, as well as canine units, sonar specialists, helicopter, and dive teams. Two days after the search was started, a search volunteer came across Alexis's cell phone case on Vista Grand Drive and Bent Tree Way. There's no doubt that it belonged to Alexis, since it was a one-of-a-kind, hand-drawn case. When it was processed, Alexis's DNA was found to be present, further proving that it must have belonged to her. A nearby pond was searched after it was completely drained since sonar devices returned some strange data. Sniffer dog units were also on standby after the dogs had reacted to something in the water. But after going through all that effort to drain and search the pond, nothing of interest was found, and it's unclear why the dogs had alerted their handlers to this location. While all of this must have been incredibly confusing and frustrating for investigators, we have to remember this must have been a torturous time for Alexis's family, as they were receiving nothing but small pieces of heartbreaking information and putting them all together, a larger picture started to emerge that pointed to a tragic and bitter ending for Alexis. Alexis's family had now become convinced that Marshall's mother also knew more than she was letting on. And on the 19th of May, Alicia Clark, his mother, was arrested and charged with aiding and abetting. But she was released just a short while later after it was found there wasn't enough evidence to prove that she knew anything about Alexis's disappearance, nor her son's potential involvement in her supposed demise. While all of this was being discovered, the Oakley City Council decided to offer a $10,000 reward to anyone who came forward with information on Alexis's disappearance. An anonymous donor later added an extra 50000 to that amount, and in May of 2022, the council added a further 40000 to that amount, bringing the reward to $100,000. It had now become apparent to everyone involved in Alexis's case that Marshall had something to do with her disappearance. An investigator suggested that he ended her life on the night that she visited him, though it isn't clear why he chose to do so. As far as anyone knew, the two had ended their relationship on good terms and remained good friends with one another. So what could have gone so horribly wrong that it would prompt Marshall to take Alexis's life? Police believe that whatever took place, Marshall took Alexis's life and then placed her body in the back of his SUV, then drove to a remote location where he left her remains. But at this point, detectives didn't have any way of knowing where Alexis's remains could be found. And so they decided to apply for a search warrant, which was to be served at Marshall's father's house in Washington. Thankfully, the warrant was granted. And on the 1st of June, the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office and the United States Marshal Service were tasked with executing the search. The only problem was the search did not have the expected outcome. Marshall knew that investigators were hot on his trail. While he hadn't admitted anything up to this point, it's pretty clear Marshall knew far more about this case than he was willing to admit. When investigators showed up at his father's home, they did their best to coerce Marshall out of the home, but he wasn't willing to budge. He knew that if he stepped one foot out that front door, he would be arrested. And the thing was, he was right. But no one could have expected the tragedy that was about to unfold. Police body cam footage of the incident shows officers trying to convince Marshall to leave the house peacefully, with some carrying shields for their own protection. But Marshall seemingly had no plans of going down peacefully, and he can be seen suddenly emerging from the house with a large kitchen knife in his hand. And it became clear at this point, things were not about to end well. 
One officer can be heard ordering Marshall to drop the knife, but instead he lunges forward in an attempt to get to the officer, and they unfortunately had no choice but to open fire, ending Marshall's life in the process, as well as any hopes of gathering information about Alexis's disappearance. This must have been incredibly disheartening for Alexis's family, as they still had no idea where Marshall left her body, no idea what even happened to her, and now their main suspect couldn't even be put on trial for what he had allegedly done. Any hopes of getting answers from Marshall had slipped away, and it would be up to investigators alone to bring this case to a close. But that would be much easier said than done. On the 2nd of June, a press conference was held, during which investigators announced that Marshall had lost his life at the hands of police, and a full explanation was given of the events leading up to this unfortunate turn of events. Most of this altercation was captured on police body cams and CCTV, so there's little debate regarding what actually happened to Marshall that day. Alexis's father spoke at this conference and reiterated that he and his family couldn't believe that Marshall was capable of hurting their daughter, since he was her first love and since they'd been together for three years up until splitting up. As mentioned before, the two were still very good friends, and no one ever expected that their relationship would take such an unnecessary and tragic turn. Well, no one except for one man, it seems. One of Marshall's friends, whose name has never been revealed to the public, came forward to speak to investigators about a strange conversation he had with Marshall about two weeks before Alexis disappeared. In a very surprising turn of events, his friend revealed that Marshall approached him one day and stated that he was thinking of ending Alexis's life, though he didn't say why. He then asked whether his friend knew of any good places where he could hide her body after the deed was done. Marshall was completely upfront about this, totally out in the open, but his friend couldn't figure out why in the world Marshall would want to do something like this. Rather than go to the police, his friend suggested that a septic tank would be a good hiding spot, or that he should think about burying her in a remote forest somewhere. When asked why he decided to remain quiet about this rather than report what Marshall had told him to the police, he stated that he thought Marshall was kidding around and that he never thought he would actually go through with ending her life. In essence, he thought that Marsha was just upset with her, and this was some sort of dark joke or some way to blow off steam. Obviously, this is not something that any parent ever wants to hear, and to learn that their daughter's passing could have been avoided if this man had just come forward immediately after Marshall approached him, well, it must be a gut-wrenching moment, and I can only imagine what thoughts must have been going through the minds of Alexis's family at this point. This one man could have helped save their daughter's life but because of either a miscommunication or maybe even fear, he didn't. But as was the case with Marshall's friend, there's no way of telling what's going on in someone's mind, and I'd like to think that if he thought Marshall was serious about ending Alexis's life, he would have come forward. But at this point, it was all too late. All that Gwen and Rowena and the rest of Alexis's family could do now was just keep searching in hopes that they could somehow find their daughter's remains but it would ultimately be someone completely unconnected to the case who would contact police when they made a very grim discovery. A resident of Plymouth, California was using a metal detector in a remote area off of Jackson Road when he stumbled across what he believed to be human remains and immediately contacted the local sheriff's office. When investigators traveled to the site, they realized that this man had, in fact, stumbled across partial human remains. Police immediately suspected they likely belonged to Alexis, considering the location in which they were found. All they needed to do now was confirm this theory. But this wouldn't take as long as you might have thought, because they soon found more evidence at the same site, including earrings that her family identified as hers. They were even able to provide photos of Alexis wearing these exact earrings. Police also found remnants of the garbage bags that Marshall was seen unloading and loading from his car, along with pieces of duct tape that he must have used to secure the bags while he was transporting them. The rest of the area was thoroughly searched, but nothing further was found. What's particularly shocking here is when investigating the contents of the bags, as well as the remains that were found by the metal detector, well, it painted a very grim picture of Alexis's final moments. That's because Alexis's remains weren't just found in one bag or in one location, there were multiple pieces of this puzzle. Police speculated that the rest of Alexis's remains must have been scattered in different areas, though they were unable to determine whether this was done by Marshall or by wildlife in the area. Though the most probable theory is the former, considering the multiple bags he was seen unloading and loading at his mother's house. 
Unfortunately, police now had the daunting task of informing Alexis's family that their daughter had finally been found, but certainly not how anyone had hoped. In the wake of this, Alexis's father made a public statement, saying, despite all the pain, anger, frustration, and grief, we're somehow relieved that she's been found and we can finally bring her home. He thanked everyone who helped search for his daughter for the nine months since she disappeared. But the weight of this revelation, it was clearly not what the family wanted to hear. Thanks to the earrings found in Plymouth, it was all but certain that the remains that were found belonged to Alexis. The only problem was a coroner couldn't say with any certainty how Alexis had lost her life. The case had finally run its full course, but for Alexis's family, there was no closure. Gwyn stated that he and the rest of Alexis's family would continue searching for the rest of her remains. And in January of 2023, a group of more than 700 searchers set out once again in an effort to locate them. This time they were successful as another set of remains was located, but sadly it's unlikely that any more will ever be found. DNA tests were carried out on the newly discovered remains and they were confirmed to belong to Alexis, but no one knows how many other locations remains may still be scattered in. And it's just so devastating for the Gabe family to know that such a terrible, awful end can be forced upon someone who did literally nothing wrong. In March of 2023, Alexis's friends and family gathered on what would have been her 25th birthday to celebrate her life. And while they were saddened that she wasn't there with them, they were able to honor her by dedicating a park bench in her name at the Oakley City Hall. Rowena added that the park was one of Alexis's favorite spots to visit, and she could now visit the park every day since it was just a short walk from the family's home. The case is now closed, but for Alexis's family, there's still many unanswered questions, and there's nothing that can help put their minds at ease after something like this. There's just nothing. They're adamant that Marshall didn't act alone in disposing of Alexis's body and have reiterated on many occasions that they're of the opinion that his mother has failed to disclose certain details that no one else was privy to. But investigators nor her family have any way of proving Marshall's mother's involvement. There's just no evidence to link her to the case, at least none that would hold up in court. After all is said and done, one can't help but feel that this was a completely nonsense crime committed by someone whom Alexis trusted but that trust was betrayed in the most heinous way imaginable, especially since there doesn't seem to be any specific reason why Marshall would want to end her life. To call this crime senseless, well, that doesn't even begin to describe it. Thanks again to Dice Dreams for sponsoring today's video. Download Dice Dreams for free and enjoy quality time with no ads. Just click the link in the description. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's completely free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to help support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But. My name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.